Now, when you're completing your client interview, your client consultation, you're going to have to write some SMART goals. And before you do that, I highly recommend you have a little go at practicing doing that before you work with a real live client, because it does take a little bit of experience, a little bit of practice, but I'm gonna hopefully make it much, much clearer during this video. So the learning outcomes are, by the end of this session, you will be able to explain the purpose of SMART goal setting, and you're gonna be able to write SMART goals for your clients. So before we begin, have a little think about what the SMART acronym stands for. So you probably noticed on that very first slide, so if you took it all in, great. If not, just have a think about what it might mean. What do those letters stand for? And you can even do, you know, pause this video, do a bit of Googling, see what else is out there. What you'll actually find is there's some, there's some variations, which we will talk about. So the SMART acronym stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Timely. And typically, the specific and the measurable doesn't really change. So if you have a look online, you'll find that there are slight variations, and they tend to vary with the A and the R. So sometimes you might see achievable as agreed, so making sure those clients are agreed with the client. You may also see the realistic written as relevant, so make sure that the goals are relevant to your client. Typically, we go with this one. This is the one that the awarding body uses, uh, and it's pretty good. So when we talk about goals being specific, we want to make sure that they are very, very specific, so they're not left open to interpretation. When it comes to writing the goal, we also want to, want to know and be confident that we can actually measure it. We can measure where the client is now in relation to where they want to be. And then we can measure it again later on to see if they're progressing and moving in the right direction and moving towards that goal. Now, obviously, we want it to be achievable. If it's not achievable, it's going to be demoralizing rather than motivating. And we want it to be realistic. And, and this is quite personal because it, it might be realistic for one person, but not necessarily for somebody else. So realistic for that person's age, gender, abilities, uh, and, and their time frame. You know, what, how much time do they have in their life and how much can they commit to this particular goal? And then we want it to be timely, or you'll see this sometimes written as time bound. So you basically want a deadline for the goal. If you don't have a deadline, then often people will lose motivation or they won't even have the motivation from the start. Because if it's an open ending goal, you know, we'll do this one day, then they might think, well, I can put that off till Monday or I can put that off till next month. So the timely, having a deadline creates a little bit of urgency and a bit of accountability. So let's have a look at two sort of poor examples. So one poor example could be a goal simply written as to improve my fitness. Well, everybody wants to do that, don't they? Not terribly specific at all. We, we don't know what we're measuring because if you think about your components of fitness, you've got five components of fitness, well, just health-related components, you know, cardiovascular fitness, body composition, strength, endurance, flexibility. So which one of those is it that the person wants to work on? So we need to establish that. Um, we then need to figure out, okay, how are we going to measure this? We need to know where they are now in relation to, to where they want to be to know whether it's achievable for them. Um, is it realistic? Has, have, have you explained to them what they need to do in order to make this goal a reality? Because once you actually tell them what they need to do, they might be like, well, actually, it's not worth it. Don't think I do want this goal anymore. And then what's the time frame? When do they want to do it? And a lot of the time, they will have an idea in their head. If you, you know, te tease out the information, probe them a little bit, they might say, well, actually, yeah, I've got a holiday in six months and, you know, I'm supposed to be fitting into my bikini or um, I've got a wedding, I've got to get into my suit, whatever it may be. Um, so I really want to lose this amount of weight before them. Another one you'll get quite common is people just say, oh, you know, I just want to lose weight and tone up. So again, not specific enough, how much weight? And 
you know, sometimes people might be thinking, well, actually, deep down, I don't really care about the weight so much. I don't really care what the scales say. I just want my waist smaller or, you know, I want my hips smaller. I want to get to a, a smaller dress size or I want to be able to see muscle definition. So some better examples would be perhaps to improve my five kilometer run time from 22 minutes to sub 20 minutes in six months. So this is obviously a very, very specific goal here, not left open interpretation whatsoever. And we've got a, we can definitely measure that, can't we? Because if somebody goes for a 5K run, we can measure that with a you know fitness tracker. And is it achievable? Well, if we look at the time frame, we're knocking two minutes off in six months. So we, we can assume that it's potentially possible. But what you will find is that with different goals, you often have to do a bit of research. So you can do just you know, a simple bit of Googling. You don't have to go to the library or anything, but just go to a bit of Googling, see what some of the experts are saying, um, go to like a, a credible authority. You, know, you might look on the like the Runners World website and say, you know, what's what's a typical um, realistic amount of progress for a runtime, for example, in what you know, in what in what time frame? So you know, everyone's going to have different goals. You'll start getting quite good at knowing the sort of parameters around specific goals, but um, yeah, you will have to do a bit of research generally. And also, don't forget, everybody's different. You know, we're all individuals, and just because the general guidelines say that someone could do that in six months might not necessarily mean that this person can, particularly if they aren't willing to commit the time, the training and everything else that goes with that. So, however, let's assume this is achievable. Um, the person's agreed to everything, the plan, it's realistic given the time frame. And look, we've got six months on the end there, so we know it's a timed, we've got a deadline. So that is definitely a smart goal. Another example, to reduce my waist circumference from 100 centimeters to 85 centimeters in six months. Well, that's definitely specific, really specific. We're talking about fat loss, but from a specific area. We're also looking at whether it's achievable and realistic. Well, again, if we've had a conversation with this client and they're happy that they're gonna have to increase their exercise, they're gonna have to reduce their calorie intake, um, they're, they're committed to this, they've agreed this is a goal they're passionate about, then we can probably tick those boxes as well. And that is a safe and realistic amount to lose in that time frame. So you can you can easily lose half a centimeter a week um, if you're losing, you know, if you're losing about half a kilo of fat per week, which again is doable, you can easily lose half a centimeter off your waist. So we can assume all those things uh, and we've got a time frame on there. So another good, smart goal. Now, we've also got different types of goals. So, you know, the ones we just looked at um, previously would technically be what we call performance goals, but you can also have process goals. And process goals are quite nice sometimes to start people off, um, especially beginners, because they're new to this. They might be new to this whole exercise thing. And actually, their goal simply is to turn up. Turn up, get the program done. So a process goal is something you really have got com complete control over. So this example here, to increase my moderate physical activity from 50 minutes per week to 150 minutes per week in six months. So they're going to gradually progress the minutes every week until they get to about the 150 mark. Now, when it comes to guidelines for whether that's realistic, um, very, very sort of, well, a, a crude or generalized guideline is when it comes to volume of work, most people can tolerate around about 10% per week. So if you're doing minutes or mileage, you could increase by about 10% per week. Now that is a very, very rough guideline because there'll be plenty of people that can do more and there'll be plenty of people that would perhaps need to do less but if you've got somebody that's completely sedentary and you suddenly said we're going to do 150 minutes per week starting from this week 
well, that's obviously way more than 10% because they're doing, they were doing nothing before. But it might be that actually they're fine with it. You know, it's moderate physical activity. It's not overly strenuous. So actually they're, pros- they're possibly going to be fine with that. Um, so, you know, use the guidelines um, carefully. Now with vigorous exercise, it might be a more realistic to say the 10% improvement thing because vigorous is more intense, it's harder. So if they're doing 50 minutes of vigorous exercise, then pushing up to 55 minutes the following week might be a more sensible target. Now you've also got performance goals. So actually we were, you know, we were looking at performance goals at the start, but performance tends to be like, how well is this person performing in a given task activity? And it's very, it's data driven usually, meaning we we want numbers. We want quantitative data. So this one here, increase my back squat from 100 kilos to 120 kilos in six months. So again, you know, we're looking at volume increases. Um, So that could be completely achievable for this individual. It may not. If somebody's been training for a long, long time and they're very, very close to their peak, it might be difficult for them to get as much as that because we've got, you know, we've got a twenty percent improvement there um, in six months, which is a lot. If I've done my maths right, I think it is. Yeah, twenty percent, um, which is a lot when it comes to strength training and lifting. But if they were, you know, if they've, they they're fairly new to lifting then an extra 20 kilos isn't huge. It's not a huge amount. So a lot of it is going to be horses for courses. And like I said, you'll get very, very good at training specific people to get specific results. So your own kind of anecdotal research will help guide you on a lot of this. Um, But we can certainly call it a SMART goal because it's specific. It's definitely measurable. It's potentially achievable, realistic for the right person. And it's got a time uh, time a deadline on it time frame and then we've got outcome goals so outcome goals are more to do with where you finish potentially in a race or a competition and you have to be careful with outcome goals because you don't have as much control over them as you would say a process goal like if you're if you had a process goal to run the park run every Saturday morning for the next six weeks. You've got a lot more control over that as over whether you win it or get in a certain place. However, more experienced clients and athletes, they love outcome goals. They're very motivated by an outcome goal. So use it for those that you think it's going to be helpful with. I wouldn't use it for a beginner. So this example here, here it says to move from finishing the top 20 to the top 10 of the Saturday park run in six months. Um, so, you know, is that realistic and achievable? Really does depend on the individual and how much they're training. I mean, if you knew that the people that are finishing the top 10 on average did a certain amount of training per week, all you've got to do is exceed what they're doing. Better nutrition, better sleep. Potentially, you'd be in that top 10. So, uh, you know, we can't always be absolutely sure whether something's achievable or realistic, but I think as long as it's not a ridiculous goal and the client has agreed to it and is buzzed up by it, then you can't go too wrong, really. Now, we're going to move on to what I call milestones. Um, so we, we often talk about goal setting in the the terms of long term, medium term or short term. And the reason we do this is because if somebody's got a goal to lose, say, 20 kilos of body fat, that's going to take some time. You know, that potentially is going to be up 12 months, maybe longer. And that's quite an intimidating goal, isn't it? So you could be making good progress every week, but all you're thinking about is how far you've got to go instead of how far you've come. And some people will lose their way a bit or lose motivation if they don't have some milestones. So this is, this is actually on the right here. This is something I knocked up for one of my clients in Canva. And so I had a client that wanted to lose 10 kilos. 
And I would just move up the little icon on the right saying you are here. I would just move that up um, each time they hit a specific milestone. So if you like, you could say the, the 10 kilos at the top was the long term goal. The short term goals would have been the small increment. So losing two ki kilo each week would be there. Sorry, not two kilos each week, um, probably every month would be the, the short term. But then a medium term goal would be goal would be the four kilo loss, the six kilo loss, the eight kilo. So we've got these little milestones leading up to the to the long term goal. So let's have another little look, look at what that could look like. So when it comes to fat loss, goal setting is probably one of the most easiest things you can do for fat loss. Is oh, sorry, goal setting for fat loss is probably the one of the easiest ways you can goal set because it's a little bit more of an exact science. It's not an exact science, but it's more of an exact science than a lot of other things. So for example, let's say um, somebody wanted to lose some weight and you know lose some fat, particularly off their waist. A short-term goal could be to lose 1.8 kilos of body fat and reduce my waist by 2.52 centimeters in four weeks. And you might be thinking, what are these numbers about? Well, over here, you can see here, a safe and realistic amount of weight loss is 0.5 to 0.9 kilos of fat per week. So let's just talk about that a bit for a moment. Now, the American College of Sports Medicine and a couple of other credible authorities have you know, in agreement with this is anything more than 0.9 kilos of fat loss per week is very, very unlikely, or sorry, I should say 0.9 kilos of weight is very, very unlikely to be coming from fat. We can't metabolize fat as fast, uh, faster than that. So you're probably going to be losing some muscle glycogen, so stored carbs, water. So your any any greater weight loss beyond 0.9 kilos per week week is not coming from fat, basically. So having a massive calorie deficit, all it's going to do is make you feel like crap, drop your metabolism dramatically, which is going to create problems further down the line, and uh, really affect your performance. And potentially, you'll be malnourished as well. So the absolute limit recommendation we go for is 0.9 kilos per week. Now, actually, if we go for a more modest approach, 0.45 kilos, so that'd be a pound of fat a week, then we can be pretty certain that's coming from fat. And it will be a more uh, enjoyable experience as well. It won't be quite so tough. Now, when you lose that kind of amount, you know, again, this is a very rough, rough guideline, but you're potentially going to be losing off your waist whilst doing that about 0.63 um, centimeters for every half a kilo, 0.5 kilo, uh, sorry, 0 0.5 kilos of fat lost. So, I mean, these are very specific numbers, but I always, I, in my head, I'm always like, okay, so for every pound of fat lost, if you're still working in pounds, is about half a centimeter off your waist. That's how I kind of remember it. Um, so that's how you can work that out. So then let's go for a medium term goal. We've got to lose 3.6 kilos of body fat and reduce my waist by 5.04 centimeters in eight weeks. And then long term to lose 5.4 kilos of body fat and reduce my waist by 7.56 centimeters in 12 weeks. So this is just an example. Now, obviously, I've chosen there four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. You don't have to do that. You can do whatever you like. You could do 12 months, six months, three months, you know, break it down that way. Uh, the important thing is really just to make sure that it's always smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed, and that um, you, you do break the goal down, so long, medium, and short. Let's look at weight gain now. So you may get a client that actually wants to gain some mass and they are, the guidelines are actually going to be different between men and women. So women don't have anywhere near as much testosterone as men and testosterone is the main hormone responsible for building muscle. So we, us guys do have an advantage when it comes to building muscle. So we can do it at a slightly faster rate. So 
Let's have a look at this where we've got short term goal is to gain 0.25 to 0.5 kilos of muscle in four weeks. Now, we're taking that, we're using that because of the guideline that a safe and realistic amount of weight gain, muscle, is 0.25 to 0.5 kilos per month. Um, and that's for women, obviously. So with a bit of a calorie surplus, only a small calorie surplus, don't need a lot. If you're training hard, you, you're doing good, good resistance training, then you should be able to convert that surplus into muscle. But it is a slow process, which is why you don't want that surplus to be too high because anything you can't convert into muscle, it's going to be converted into body fat. So just be careful of that. Medium term to gain 0 0.4, sorry, 0 0.5 to 1 kilo of muscle in eight weeks. Long term, gain 0 0.75 to 1.5 kilos of muscle in 12 weeks. So it's just maths really, isn't it? And we're just working out what that's likely to be over the longer term. Now, a slight different for men, as I said. So for men, short-term goal, gain 0 0.5 to 1 kilo of muscle in four weeks. So you're pretty much doubling the guideline there, really. They can do it sort of twice the speed. So a safe and realistic amount of weight gain muscle is 0.5 to 1 kilo per month. Now, if you're watching this, there's going to be somebody thinking, well, wow, that's nonsense. My mate gained a lot more weight than that in a shorter space of time. Now, don't forget these are guidelines and people, we get anomalies, we get people that fall uh, either side of the guidelines. But also, for men, testosterone levels vary across their, across ages. So when you're 18, you're always going to be able to gain it faster than when you're 40 or, you know, or 60. And also don't forget, for, we can't uh, ignore the fact that performance enhancing substances are a thing. Loads and loads of um, individuals in gyms will be taking stuff that you don't know about. Um, so potentially, you know, if someone's gaining mass very, very quickly, you can well, I was going to say you can pretty much assume, but I suppose we, sh we should be careful not to assume, but there's a, <laughs> a good indication if it's gained very, very quickly. It's, it's been a little bit of help, let's just say. Now, medium term, we can obviously increase that to one to two kilos of muscle in eight weeks or one and a half to three kilos of muscle in 12 weeks. So, 12, I mean, that's that's a good number. 12 weeks, 3 kilos of muscle. That's a noticeable amount of muscle mass there. So, 12 weeks, the person's already going to be looking more muscular. Okay, last one. Let's look at this now. So, this is looking more specifically towards those that just want to be more physically active. And certainly older generations, and I'm including myself in this. I'm 40, almost 40, just about to turn 43 and I'm of course I'm interested in my my cardiovascular fitness and my muscle mass and everything else but actually I'm happy just to keep turning up and doing the exercise to get the health benefits that kind of motivates me more these days so give you a guideline you could break it up when it comes to goal setting for this so this would be like a process goal you could break it up based on their physical activity. So from weeks one to four, increase my average steps per day from three and a half thousand to 5,000. You might think, God, that's not very much, but don't forget if they're very sedentary, they're gonna have to you know, get used to finding more activity in their life. So we don't wanna jump it up too much. Maybe complete one 15 minute vigorous intensity CV session and one 30 minute strength building session. So we're not quite hitting the, uh, the, the, the guidelines, but we're working towards it. And don't forget, the guidelines are here. So 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week. So we're trying to push towards that or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic activity. Or you can do a combination of the two, basically. Don't forget, we also want people to do strength building uh, sessions, two or more a week limit their time being sedentary. And again, you can use the 10% volume progression rule, really, 10% um, per week. Now, medium term, so from weeks five to eight, we can go from 5,000 to seven, seven and a half thousand steps. 
complete two 15 minute vigorous intensity CV sessions and still keep to the one strength session. Then from weeks nine to 12, seven half thousand to 10,000, complete two 30 minute vigorous intensity CV sessions and two 30 minute strength building sessions. So across 12 weeks, you can see there, that would be quite nice, wouldn't it? For somebody that's basically sedentary to eventually be doing 10,000 steps a day, two 30 minute cardio sessions and two 30 minute strength sessions. Wonderful. So smart goal setting can get a bit confusing, but it doesn't have to be. And it's just sensible goal setting, really. You're not being silly with it and, you know, making sure that you've got deadlines for these things and breaking it down into those milestones I talked about. If you've got beginners, don't forget, process goals are probably going to be better. And um, Performance goals are good because everybody does care about the data. People do want to know that they are getting better. Um, but uh, when it comes to actually applying this in real life situations, you know, you'll probably find your own way with it. You'll find your own style with this. Um, you know, what we're teaching you here is, is pretty much the awarding body standards. It's get you through your qualifications. And then you might find your own, your own way with it. But it's certainly good to give clients an idea of where they should be heading. Um, you know, working out what are their overarching goals. Okay, let's now get this into something a little bit more structured to help guide what we're doing in the training sessions.